All right. I want to welcome you all tonight. It's a nice big group. So, oh, it's eight, ten, twelve of us. It's, that's great. Um, we're going to start the new series tonight, Why Heaven Matters. And it also starts with a, a video clip. And uh, then you work with the book. For those that are online that do not have it, uh, there's a book that's available from um, the author called The Real Heaven. And it's, um, I'm trying to find what the, I think it will show it as we go into it. It's, I'm trying to remember their group, what they call themselves. But if you want to find out how to get a book, um, if you call me outside of the meeting, um, my number is 714-474-4641, and we can arrange it for you. So let's start with the video, and we'll go from there. You want to get that number again? 714? 7? Uh, let me get it where it's right. <laughs> okay. 714? 714? 474? 474? 474? 46? 46? 41? 46. 41. A lot of 4s. Yeah. 714? 474? 464? 46? 46? 41. 1. Four six four one at the end. Four six four one. Yes. Oh, I had a. Thank you. There, there we, we go. go. Yeah. Think, oh yeah, heaven, heaven, future. If I ask you, what are the three main things that happen in heaven? I mean, other than maybe some singing, what would it be? If you uh, met a little boy that's 10, 11 years old with leukemia and was going to die. And he looked you in the eyes and said, will you explain to me exactly what heaven's like and what it's going to be like? Because I really want to be there. What would you say to me? And what I can tell you is for most of us, we don't know. I mean, archaeologists have studied every culture in the world. And here's what I can tell you about every culture in all mankind. There's an absolute conviction of an afterlife. Whether it's painting on caves thousands of years ago, or whether it's tombs with treasures, or whether it's some story in almost every culture about when people are good after they die, some good things happen to them, and people that are evil, some terrible things happen to them. All across the board, God says eternity has been planted in the heart of mankind. And so what we're going to do is we're going to study what's heaven like. Not what books say, not what movies say, not what we've heard, not what we might unconsciously think, but what does God say heaven's like? Are you ready? Open your notes and let's jump in together. Why study heaven? I want to give you three compelling reasons. Reason number one is our misconceptions are crippling us. We have some false thinking, some misconceptions about heaven. For example, uh, we have a misconception. We think we can't know much about heaven. It's mysterious. It's all just about, you know, floating clouds. And, and people will quote a verse in 1 Corinthians 2 that says, I haven't seen or ear heard or entered into the heart of man all the good that God has stored up for those who love him. And they say, see, you can't know what's going to happen. In the name of that song, you can only imagine. Now let me tell you for sure, you can only imagine because it's way beyond what we can comprehend, but the very next verse in context says, but we have the mind of Christ. And actually the Bible is very clear about what heaven is, but I will tell you it's different than most of us think it is. Another misconception is that it's an otherworldliness. It's these disembodied spirits floating around, playing harps in eternity, sort of... Um, earning our wings, there's angels, every movie, you know, you can never see people's feet, there's always the fog machines going on, and there's floating clouds, and people are in white, and it's ethereal, and I don't know about you, but part of that sounds attractive for a half hour, or maybe 45 minutes, or I think worship pastors are going to love it. But if heaven, if misconception number three, is one very, very, very long church service, it might be really boring. I actually have read in a book where a, a pastor, a Bible-believing pastor, actually confided in another pastor, 
you know what? If it's just one really long church service, I, I want to be with Jesus and I want my sins forgiven, but I'm not sure I just want to actually go to heaven. Uh, I've talked to people when they're young and we talk about the return of Christ or what would happen if you died. I've had people say, I don't want Jesus to come back until I get married. I haven't even had sex yet. Or I've talked to an elderly couple who were two or three you know, years away from this big moment. They're going to go to Hawaii. I don't want Jesus to come back because we haven't even gone to Hawaii yet. In other words, we don't know what heaven's like, but it can't be better than marriage, sex, or Hawaii. Uh. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a limited view, don't you think? Those misconceptions, then, lead to some predictable results. One, we have a very temporal perspective instead of an eternal perspective. There's a reason why the church, the old word used to be worldly. We live for the now. The first two millennium of the church... Heaven was a central topic. Teaching was paramount about heaven and hell and judgment and clarity and what it would be like. And in the last hundred years, as I'll share in a minute, there's been very little teaching on heaven, let alone the new heaven and the new earth. Second is, since we don't know what heaven's like, we don't study it much, we don't think about it much. I mean, when I, when I meet people that have cancer... When I talk to people with debilitating diseases, when I go into third world countries where situations are very, very difficult, they actually think a lot about heaven. Most of us don't. Heaven holds very little hope or peace or that longing for home. You know that sense that for some of you that travel, 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 and you've been on planes in different countries, and you know you finally get home, and like you lay in your own bed for one night, and you get up the next morning, and you go, it is so good to be home. Multiply that infinitely. That's what heaven's going to be like. But most people, it doesn't create any longing or any hope. I gave this book, uh, probably the most definitive work in recent years, Heaven by Randy Alcorn. And we made it available upstairs. You can get it on Amazon. But he literally read 140 books, all written within the last 200 years on heaven. Then studied all the Bible. And then compilated it and put it together and came to the conclusion, I never heard of any of this. That's the book I gave my dad. Uh, he read when he could it by himself for a while. And then he got where he really couldn't sit up and read very well. His wife, that's a pretty thick book, she read it out loud to him. And I'll never forget, it was a few months later and I came back and the days were getting really close and we knew he wouldn't live long. And my dad uh, went through horrendous times as a young man and World War II and some other issues. And he was paralyzed most of his life by fear. Uh, I don't know if any of you had kind of World War II dads, but I would remember every night my dad would get up and he'd check all the locks in the house. 20 minutes later, he'd get up and check all the locks in the house. And you're thinking, like, they were locked the last time. But he had been through so much, he lived with overwhelming fear. And I remember uh, a nurse came in, and you know, he'd read this book on heaven, and she was talking to him about you know, what they might do, and could they extend his life, and resuscitation, and, and I mean, he couldn't move his legs now. And he turned to her and said, Lady, no matter what you do, don't use any extreme means, don't resuscitate me. Don't put any feeding tubes down me. Here's what I want you to know. It's all written down. I'm going to heaven and it's great. When you understand what heaven really is, it changes how you live life now. In fact, that's why the second reason we need to study, are you ready for this? We're commanded. I mean, this isn't a suggestion. We're commanded to think about heaven. Colossians 3. Follow along as I read. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, in other words, you're a Christian, you've died with Him, you've been raised up with Him, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Notice this command, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Why? For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. A lot of the issues, a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the lack of peace that we as Christians have, a lot of the temptations that we struggle with, if we had a crystal clear picture of not this floating around in clouds and maybe playing some harps or some boring forever church service, which is completely different from what the Bible teaches. We would have a longing for heaven and it would allow us this eternal perspective to make wiser priority decisions now. 
In fact, the final reason is not just the misconceptions and not simply to command it, but our faulty view of heaven destines us to a wasted life on earth. Ooh. Think of that now. That's true. That's strong. A faulty view of heaven destines us to a wasted life on earth. Open your Bibles, if you will. Gospel of John. Go ahead. Just open right there in the middle. I want to give you a little context as you find it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Right there in the middle of New Testament. Now, Jesus has come and selected 12. One has betrayed him by now. In John chapter 13, he's washed their feet. They've had the Lord's Supper. This is his last night on the earth. He's got 11 committed guys, about 120 people that are semi-committed, that when he's resurrected, they'll at least get on the team. And he has one final night to talk to a group of people. And the God of the universe who made all that there is, who's taken on human flesh, lived a perfect life, he's going to die for the sins of all people of all time. Three days later, he's going to rise from the dead. And he's preparing these 11 guys, mostly blue-collar workers, to transform the world. What's he going to tell them? What's he going to tell them? He knows they're going to be rejected. He knows that every single one of them, save one, will be martyred for the message and the mission. And the one that isn't martyred ends up on a Roth writing the book of Revelation. He realizes they're going to have to have courage and be sustained through the most difficult times. They're going to live in a world where there's persecution in Rome, where there's immorality like the world has never known, where there's a different God on every corner. And so this is what he says to them. Chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have not have told you, for I go to prepare a place, a specific place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, notice here's the key. I will come again, I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What he understood was, a crystal clear view, not of floating around, not of playing harps, not of some ethereal experience, but a crystal clear view of what heaven is like, and that new heaven on a new earth with real relationships, and specifically what it's like, would sustain them through the most difficult time in all of human history. And they persevered because... They were waiting and living for, Hebrews says, a city that God was building. That they were actually had this sense of the future that was clear and tangible and real and attractive. Now turn the page because here's the question I want to ask and answer. If heaven is so important to Jesus, if we're commanded to think about heaven, how in the world did we get so misinformed in the last hundred years? How is it that heaven, I mean literally... Can I just a quick one? How many people have heard a sermon on heaven before? Wow. Three, four hands. Now think of that. Well, first of all, the father of lies wants us to get sucked into a world system that he's behind. So you know he's behind this. <coughs> Second, somewhere along the line, and it happens, if you church, study church history, you have centuries that bleed this way and they focus on a few things and to the neglect of this, and then the pendulum swings back a couple of <laughs> centuries and you, you see this. What I have here is nearly every pastor in America, these are classic theology books. Every pastor that, that teaches like I teach has these. Here's a six volume by Schaefer. Six volumes. See all these volumes in red? There are two pages on the new heaven and the new earth. This is uh, uh, Burkhoff, classic systematic theology, 737 pages. There's one page on the new heaven, the new earth. Uh, this is called, this is Baxter's uh, Explore the Book. That's a thick book. Uh, there's about four pages near the end. Uh, Hodge has three volumes. He has three pages on the new heaven and the new earth. And Ryrie, who is uh, one of my professors, who talks very clearly about all the end times and tribulation and mid and post and all the issues, you get to the new heaven and the new earth and it's not included. We haven't taught people in seminaries about the new heaven and the new earth and what heaven's really like. So pastors haven't taught it to the people. And so most people... Why in the world is the church so gravitated toward now is all that matters? 
I gotta get it now. I deserve a break today. Uh, right now is the only thing that counts. Why are priorities, do they get so skewed? Why is temptation so hard to resist? I'm going to suggest that unlike the early apostles and unlike the first two millennium of the church, we really have no idea what heaven is really like. So uh, let's dig in. A theology of heaven. Do a little research together. The word heaven, if you're just opening your Bible and you read the word heaven, there's three different ways that it's used. Sometimes the word heaven literally means just the atmosphere or the sky. Okay? I mean, it's the heaven. Uh, sometimes the word in heaven is used as the stars and the galaxies. We, we sang a song. The moon and the stars. Psalm 19. Uh, the, the stars declare the glory of the Lord. The third use of heaven is the abode of God. In other words, it's where God is. It's where God hangs out. It's a specific place. If you open up to the book of Revelation and you read chapter 4 and chapter 5, and it has the throne and the elders and literally what theologians call that the intermediate heaven. We'll talk about that in a minute. But that's, that's where God is, the abode of God, heaven. So just to get our terms straight, we're going to talk about the third phrase. Notice, I just did a little a topical study for you, the promise of heaven, and you'll notice in your small group material, this would be a lot of fun for you. Take 15 or 20 minutes each morning, and just look up these verses. Heaven seems to be very important to God, even though we don't know much about it. Let me just go through. According to the scripture, here's some promises related to heaven. It's a real, tangible place, John 14. The Father is there, Matthew 6. Remember, our Father who are in heaven. Jesus is at his right hand, Hebrews 9. Believing loved ones are there, Hebrews 12. Our names are recorded there, Luke 10. We have an inheritance. Next week we're going to talk about that. I mean, when you think about an inheritance, I mean, if your dad was a billionaire and he just told you, I just want you to know, I'm leaving everything to you, wouldn't there be a little bit of excitement that when he's gone, there's something coming your way? God says you have an eternal inheritance. Those aren't just kind of bubbly, gobbly, biblical words. There's something real that you get. Our citizenship is there, Philippians 3. Specific eternal rewards are given. We talked about that in the last series. It's the best of earth better. It's very tangible. It's very real. There's an old earth that's fallen. We're going to learn there's a new earth. Sin, death, and sorrow are absent, Revelation 22. And then something that most people don't think about, adventure, work, discovery, and rulership await us when the new heaven comes down on this new earth that really will be heaven. So, I don't know about you, that's a pretty important list of things that are coming my way that I ought to know about. Those major issues and core themes in scripture, the confusion comes when we lump kind of how we think about heaven, the abode of God, and the intermediate heaven, and the new heaven, and the new earth. We tend to lump all those things together. They've never been separated and explained. And so because it's not clear, it provides very little real tangible sense of this is what heaven's like. So let me give you next, heaven in historical context. And when I use the word heaven, don't think just of this intermediate heaven of where people go right now. I want you to think of heaven as the abode of God. I want you to think of the key with heaven. Every time when you read heaven, it's where God is. Where God is. And so, there's three major themes historically of heaven. You have Eden. God has created a perfect world. And he takes mankind in this perfect world. He creates a garden. It's pleasing to the eyes. There's a perfect place. And God from heaven visits mankind. In all likelihood, the pre-incarnate Christ, or what theologians call a theophany. And he walks with men, and he talks with men, and they have relationship. And you have Adam and Eve in this perfect environment, and they name animals, and they're told to rule and multiply, and have this amazing experience. And God created mankind in this perfect environment with the stipulation, don't eat from this one tree. So God comes and visits mankind on an earth that's perfect. There's no hurricanes, there's no tsunamis, there's no earthquakes, it's perfect. Then we'll move to chapter 3, and sin enters the world. Romans 8 says sin not only impacted the separation from man and God, but it impacted all of creation. Creation groans. And so now we have these 
dysfunctional things that happen in the creation as it's groaning. We have man is separated from God, and so now God sends His Son. He becomes fully God, but He's, he's already God, fully man, and He comes to live among us, to rescue us, lives a perfect life, dies upon a cross, pays for our sin, so that we can have relationship. The moment a person dies during this window of time, between Revelation, uh, Genesis 3 and Revelation 20, you immediately go into the presence of God, and it's called the intermediate heaven. Now you might jot in your notes, Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Paul, Paul says, I, I don't know what to do. He thinks he's going to be executed. If I die, I'll be immediately with Christ, and it's much better, but maybe I should stay to minister to you. You might jot down 2 Corinthians 5, 6. It says, to be absent from the body is to be home with the Lord. So there's no soul sleep, there's no delay. But when you die in the present you're immediately in the presence of God, but you don't have a resurrected body. The resurrection comes later. The future, what we have, beginning in chapters 21 and 22, is there is a new heaven and a new earth. And in resurrected bodies, we will live on this new heaven and this new earth. And, and sometimes, if I told you that you have an old car, but I'm going to give you a new car, and your old car is 15 years old and it breaks down and it has problems and I said that I'm going to give you a new car I don't think you would say I have no idea what a car is now what you know is going to drive better it's going to be more comfortable but it's going to have a lot of the same characteristics as the old car here's what I want you to see the heaven that God has planned for you is very akin to the heaven that was when he came down and created a place where he wanted to be with men that he visited. And then this old perfect environment, God longed for relationship. But there was life, there was focus, there was beauty, there was work, there was a discovery, there was learning, there was naming, there was ruling. It was real life with real people on a real earth. God promises in the future, heaven literally, we'll look at it in a minute, will come down, and there will be actually heaven on earth, the new Jerusalem, and there is a new earth with none of the problems of the fallen earth. I'm sure some of you are sitting there right now and saying to yourself, Chip, what you just shared the last 20 minutes completely blows up what I thought about heaven. Now, our picture of heaven is so mystical and obscure that it can feel like there's absolutely no connection between our life here and now. But the truth is, heaven has some similar characteristics to the earth that we now live on, and the life that we experience right now. now remember my illustration about the car, you know, the old car to the new car, uh, it runs better, uh, it's more comfortable, uh, it's more reliable, uh, you know, there's a definite upgrade, but it's still a car. Well, in the same way, heaven will be like the old earth, but believe me, a lot better. So before you jump into your discussion time, uh, let me share with you a couple things that can really make this study meaningful, impactful, I mean really make it great. Number one, everyone needs to engage and participate. You have unique insights. You have things to share that no one else has. Open up and share them. Second, in your study, there's a section called Accelerate. This is an opportunity for you to accelerate your growth. It's just 20 minutes and it's designed for you to get into the Bible and discover for yourself the truth of God's Word. So, let's get things started with the first discussion question, and it has two parts. Part one, when you walked into the study today, what was your image of heaven? And part two, how did this first session shift your understanding of what heaven is really like? Hey, have a great time in your group, and I'll see you next time. Well, I want to tell you just starting this series is already, it's just not a, a topic that I have really gone into in the past or thought about or even, I've, some of it I've caught in scripture, um, but there's some things that were said here that really blew my mind that I wasn't quite sure. So let's, let's talk it over. 
when you walked in this study today, what was your image of heaven? And you can write it down if you want to. Has anybody thought of that like to share? Endless tranquility of just aimless walking, strolling, the uh, joy of extreme tranquility and peace. I always see all my relatives up there, or all my friends. Yes. And, and of course, you want to join them. Yes. You know, you can hardly wait to, to maybe say the things that you never said before the last time that you had to see them. So it's another opportunity. Uh, when he when he got into uh, Colossians the third chapter the first four verses, I actually lived that. Uh, I had been in Globe, and I got real sick. And my wife at the time, her mother, had part of her leg amputated here in the valley. So we took them to Globe, she and my father-in-law, and. Uh, she said, uh, would, would you stay with my mom? I'm going shopping with my dad. So I said to her mom, would you like to have Jesus in your heart? She said, yes, I would. So she accepted Jesus. And when Pete came home, said, Pete, Pete, I have the Lord in my life. Do you want the Lord in your life? Yes. So he accepted Christ. But uh, we, we stayed with him then for that, that day. And we got into the next day, and I started getting very sick. I became deathly sick. I knew I was dying. But I didn't tell him. I, said, I just told her I'm sick, and I'm going home. So on the way home, I'm saying, Jesus, why have you left me? Why have you forsaken me? I'm dying. Don't you care? So I got home, and I took my shoes off, went back, and laid on my bed, and I was going to die there. And I opened my Bible to Colossians, the third chapter, in the first four verses. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ. And Christ who shall appear, you shall be with him in glory. So at that point, it's supernatural. The, the room got to a bright white glow. Christ spoke to me audibly and said, I have never left you nor forsaken you. Well, I know that. That's scriptural. And then I saw a silhouette of a hand and forearm that went inside of me. I knew it went inside of me. I couldn't feel it. It was a surgery that I could not feel. And so, so then Heavenly Father spoke two words. You're healed, and when he spoke, it was like the house was in an earthquake. Just shook everything. I jumped off the bed. No more sickness. But I learned something. I used to think that the Israelis was very wimpy. They didn't want to hear God speak. They said, oh, don't let God speak to us lest we die, Moses. We'll just die if he speaks. But he already spoke to them. The mountain was on fire and it smoked and shook. And all that, the power of God. And when I realized those people had their sin, their sin was rolled over once a year. Yeah. And they were so frightened. But I didn't have sin in my life. It, it, I was frightened. And the two words of the, of the Heavenly Father, so powerful, just, just all. I had never experienced any power like that ever before in my life. So I learned some things. And you are eager to go back and experience that for eternity, aren't you? Yeah. So that was yes. That was a real experience. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure <clears throat> exactly when all this took place. Real early in my Christian walk, I was got stuck teaching the book of Revelation to ad adults. Here I'm a 20-year-old teaching the book of Revelation. But a lot of this stuff entered me then, you know, I've, I'm going to create a place for you, and if I create a place for you, I'm going to come back and get you. So there's, there's that, and then I had a, I've had a couple of dreams, 
And uh, the first one was where we lived up in Utah. My dad was the head of the forestry department on the Ute Indian Reservation. And uh, I remember walking up sort of a hill to where the offices were there where we lived. And uh, I went inside. Nobody was there. It was empty. Big room. Chairs all around. So I sat in a chair for a while. Eventually somebody came in and got me. It was an angel. Took me outside. And... Uh, he pointed across to the mountains, and he said, you see it there? I said, yeah. He said, that's where your dad's place is. And I said, oh, okay. And then I had another dream some, sometime after that, walking down a street of a town that looked like Mayberry, okay? All these storefronts and glass windows and stuff, and the angel walking with me, and he pointed, you see that storefront? I said, that's Paula's craft store there. Okay, so. I never had one. <laughs> yeah. So there's you that. I will. Um, but I, I envision, I've, since, since I've been a Christian, always envision Christian, er, envision heaven as the perfect earth. I see myself running up and down hills, climbing mountains, on the beach. And it's funny, he brought up Hawaii, because that's one of the big thoughts in my head. I want to be on the beach in Hawaii. So, yeah. so that's heaven to me. He just confirmed everything I've already thought. One of you wanted to say something? Mm -hmm. No, there's, I think so. I guess I think differently than most people, but to me it's like being in a relationship with God and a void with Him. Like with me, with all the searches that I've had, it, like when they put in a station and I'm gone, I have no idea what's happening. And sometimes I dream things that kind of like unbelievable. And so it's not like something to touch. It's more like a... Uh, had like an internal feeling for me, like being with God Himself, Jesus Christ, kind of spiritually. And so when He raises up, we'll be like He was, but what that is, to me, I still don't know. Yes. And the Bible does say we won't know when He will come. And there's a lot of things that the Bible tells us, but we really don't know, and He God knows what it is, so. Uh, yep. And that's why we are doing the study to know more, because we don't know. Uh, anybody else have anything I want to explain or what you thought of heaven, uh, the image of heaven before you studied? Any of you read the book um, Heaven is for Real or seen the movie? It's a little, it was a Wesleyan pastor and his wife, their son got ill and actually died and went up to heaven and he was brought back and resuscitated <coughs> by the doctors and when he came back he spoke about heaven it's an incredible story one of the things he said to my, his mom he said why didn't you tell me I have a sister he says but you do have a sister you know her no my other sister and then he explained to her that the girl walked up and said I'm your sister um, he said, uh, so the mother said, knew exactly who was talking, she had a miscarriage. And the sister was the miscarriage with the baby she lost, who was waiting for them in heaven. So the mother asked him, what is her name? He said, she hasn't got a name yet, she's waiting for you to come to heaven so you can give her a name. That's something, that, that's something that really struck me when I read it. Um, there was an, there's another one with a, a, a girl that also died and was res, uh, resuscitated and brought around and she painted a picture of how she saw Jesus. Um, and I haven't seen that painting, I need you know go further into that, but this boy that was in heaven is for real met this girl and when she, he saw her painting he said, yes, that's Jesus. Clicked immediately for both of them for their experience. Um, simplicity of a child, you know, and, and, and what they saw. But I just wanted to share, share that that was something that really struck me when I saw that movie and, and, and read the book. Um, how did your impression of heaven change from tonight, if any? <laughs> In my case, it just made me. Kind of like 
I'm still, I still don't know, and it's kind of made me curious as to, you know, what it is that I, because like when I said that when I was going through all this anesthesia and all these surgeries, there were things that were revealed to me that I didn't understand. You know, and there were things that I would talk to my husband about, he looked kind of me, like one of the things that was, you know how they talk about idols, and someone was talking about something in my dream that I had, and so my answer to them was, so what is the difference between, it was like a, a toy of some kind, or some object that I don't remember. What is the difference between that and the picture of Jesus that everybody looks at, and all those brochures, that actually it's not Jesus, somebody drew that. So we're looking at this picture of Jesus, which is not Jesus. And that was one of the revelations, because, you know, that came to me on that. So it, It's very likely that Jesus has a dark complexion from mm -hmm. the from the um, the group that uh, that had lived in in Palestine in, in Nazareth and that there was a darker skinned people. All the paintings in that portray Jesus as a white person. Very likely, he's not a white person uh, from his time. And, uh, so you're right. Um, we we have been influenced in life by Hollywood by by famous painters and everything, um, what we think it is, um, it's, it's going to be interesting. One of the things that spoke to me from this section is where he spoke about on the previous page the three different the historical, um, the theology of heaven, the promise of heaven. No, it's not that one. Sorry, I'm trying to find it. Maybe. Oh, no, it's right above you. Sorry. Heaven is a historical context. There's the heaven that was passed with Eden, where basically God worked, walked on earth with Adam and Eve until the fall. And his presence was there. There's the present intermediate heaven. This is something I didn't know. I didn't know about the intermediate heaven and the new heaven. Um, that was very interesting to me to read this. And it makes sense, according to scripture as well, it makes sense. Uh, interesting thing as well that we will not get our new bodies on everything until the new heaven takes place. And that will take place after Jesus calls up the dead from the grave. And that's a time when the new bodies be created everything. Because... There's people that have been eaten by animals. There's people that have been burned to ash. So there is nobody at this present stage. But, so it, it's quite, I mean, this is, I still, like you say, I don't understand completely, and we're going to go through this in the next five weeks and get more in-depth in these studies. But it's made me think more and realize that I know very little. And, the new heaven and the new earth, that I knew from scripture that there was going to be a new heaven and new earth. It's going to be interesting. You know, it's uh, also the thing that really struck me was uh, <clears throat> the, uh, you think of death as, you know, now you're, the race has, has been run and that's it. And you're, you're going to heaven, uh, you're in the presence of God and there's, that's about all I can grasp. But this also told me that there's going to be a perfect servitude, that we will be working in heaven with God. Yes. And it's, that makes it more tangible to me. Yes. As, as something that you can, you can really grasp. And have a little, have a little bit of a better understanding. Something Brenda and I were, were is we listened to this. I, I listened to this earlier today before I listened to it now because I wanted to know what I was working with tonight. But um, one of the things that Chip said is there's going to be beautiful gardens in heaven. Now, for those of Brenda and I love gardening, not everybody likes gardening because some people just don't have green fingers. Uh, I mean, my daughter, you can give her anything or any plant, she cannot keep it alive. But uh, it, it's just great um, to think of the beauty of nature. Nature, it, 
is going to be creation is going to be restored to its full beauty in the new heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, we we know that there's a there's a heaven that we know of, but there's a third heaven, and the third heaven so far away that man could never get there on his own. It, it, it's too many too many miles away, and, and you'd think maybe a uh, man trying to get there and say he's 20 years old. And all of a sudden, he's 80 years old. He's still not there. He's too far away. It's that, impos impossible for man to get to heaven on, on his own. Yes, it is impossible. I mean, if you'd see the Tower of Babel, um, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't destroyed. The Tower of Babel wasn't destroyed, and the languages weren't given to stop people from getting to heaven. It was more to stop the idea and the focus. Yeah. Because they could never have got to heaven with that tower. Yeah. <laughs> now the Lord says it's, it's not impossible for man to do anything. And, and that's why the battle came about. Yeah. Because like you, yeah, like you said, they, they could have never got there. If they would have kept trying. <laughs> Why do you think in the modern church heaven is really talked about? Wait, I'm sorry, what was the question? Hmm? What was the question? In the modern church, heaven is really talked about. Why do you think so? He mentioned a lot of that. One of the, the one of the things that Chip said is is that if you go back in church history the things that the church concentrated on swung from centuries to centuries, and, you know, and a lot of it is, it's not taught, so it's not talked about. I, I think, as we get into this more, I think I'll be able to eventually explain what I told you last week that I couldn't explain. Yes. Because it's, uh, uh, it's natural and it's supernatural. So, I think I can eventually do that as we get into this more. Our biggest problem is God is an infinite God and we are limited, the finite people, we are mortal, He's immortal. Mm -hmm. We see things and think things and try and understand things with our limitations as a mortal. Yeah. But we cannot think like God thinks because we just, we couldn't grow. I think... Yeah, we can't comprehend it. We can't comprehend it. Yeah. It's like you said, we can't see him because we won't be able to go by and the same thing. His, his energy is so much beyond us that... And that's the thing, we, we can't understand the physical and the spiritual. And he wants us to be more spiritual, but we still want to be spiritual and hang on to our physical. Yeah. And my husband and I go through this kind of debate all the time. We can't concentrate our mind faculties on both things. We gotta, Because if you're talking to someone and they're doing something else and they say the Lord's in it or they're working on something else and you're trying to get a point across and they're not listening, they can't. There's no way they're going to comprehend it. But if they're looking at you and they're paying attention, they'll grasp something. That's the way we are spiritually. We are spirit, but do we really accept that? I think we're more scared than <coughs> spiritual. And I have that. Yeah. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you. You're all right. Bye-bye. Right. I think we're also very concerned about how we're going to get there rather than... Uh, <laughs> What we, are we going to do when we get there? As Norm mentioned, heaven is so far, it's impossible even in our lifetime to get any distance towards it. And when you, we understand it a bit more now with science and with studies, and they speak of billions of light years and millions of light years between planets and so forth. It's just crazy. It, it, you know, that's where you need, you know, like science fiction where they have warp speed and they can just <laughs> fly through the light years. But um, 
when we go to heaven, we're going to be in a warp speed that you, science fiction has never yeah. even thought of, you know? Well, you know what wow. I, I think might be a consideration is that, you know how they say bad news sells? Anything in the media, it's always the bad. The bad news is kind of the good news. You put good news on there, it's like, oh, that's nice. And I think it's kind of similar, this idea that um, now, heaven is nice, okay, but what really gets people going, you talk about the alternative, talk about help, and scares people off to death, yes. and then they do something about it, which, and it shouldn't be that way, and especially as Christians, we should be so animated by heaven that we are showing people the other side of it, showing people the, the beauty and wonder and amazement of heaven instead of running on the opposite. So. That, that's a really good point that Brenda brought up now. When you speak about hell to people, you can get them scared enough that they'll do mm -hmm. something about it. But our misconception on heaven, when we talk about heaven, we don't make them excited enough that they'll do something about it. And that's what we are looking at that this has study to provide for us. That warp speed is one one hundred thousandths of a second. <laughs> yes. uh, there was, there was a, a family member that I was praying for. Uh, there was two of us praying for this young man. And he shook violently. Then we felt uh, uh, his soul and spirit left him. He's gone. It's, it's going to be really interesting. There was something else you somebody yeah, I was going to say, my husband and I were discussing that before I went into the procedure today about heaven and hell and some churches, how they preach and they get people motivated and they get spiritual because they talk about hell and that scares them. They, they have to choose between hell yeah. and heaven. Yes. And so they get motivated into getting into the spiritual realm. Yes. All right, so... I'm sorry it's late. Um, I'm going to, no, I'm sorry, I, please, it's not your fault. No, no, I, I'm just, I have to watch my time, yeah? Um, God has more time. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I'd like to, we saw the, this, I'm just trying to get the right page, where was I? Oh yes, there was a fourth point here. Chip said a faulty view of heaven destines us to a wasted life on earth. And his point was the disciples had a very healthy view of heaven and a good understanding of heaven and therefore had a very spiritual motivated life on earth as they were looking forward to the future. And we pray that that this study, as we complete it over the next five weeks, is going to get us moving as well and motivate us to a, a more healthy approach. I'd like you to... Um, and I'm not going to go through the rest of this chapter. This is for you. Live it out. B-I-O. Come before God. Do life community. What Chip has arranged with this book is he's trying to encourage you not just to be on a Wednesday night study, but to continue in the week with these questions and work through it, that it becomes routine. a daily thing, yes. And, and, and that, it, that you can really get deep into the understanding of this and that. So I'd like to ask you, and maybe next week, just before we'll start, I'll ask has anybody got anything else further out of the deep depth of this as they went into this and finished this chapter. So I'd like you to look at it. Um, next week we're going to carry on with um, the, the study that we had tonight, where it will be part two, um, why is there heaven? Then the third week actually starts on what is heaven like. So. You you will take it from there. So, 
I'm looking forward to this and I'm so glad to have you all here tonight. I'm going to close in prayer and if you want to chat after that, you're welcome. But let's close in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I want to ask for forgiveness for not spending more time in your word and studying your word and letting your Holy Spirit open it up and speak to me. We have so much available with the internet today, with teaching online. We have no excuse. I pray that as we complete this course in heaven, Lord, that you will just open it to our hearts and that you will encourage us and motivate us as we move along. And as we get more and more excited about heaven, let us be more and more excited about sharing that with others and getting them to the same place. Pray you be with us now and as we go into this week. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So, I'm going to thank you all and we will see you next week.